The tribulation period will be one of the most dreadful times in the history of the human race. Jesus himself said nothing has ever been like it before or ever will be again. Today's program and our last program is going to be involved with this matter of the tribulation period. There are some people who say that the Holocaust of the Jews in World War II was Jacob's trouble, that there is no other Jacob's trouble yet to come. But we contend that a tribulation period is ahead for this world. And uh, then there are some who say that it's three and a half years long. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me just how long is the tribulation period. J.R., on our last broadcast, we went into several reasons uh, why the tribulation period, in, in our view, must be seven years in length, at least, at a minimum, it must be seven years in length. And, and J.R., its purpose is, uh, is, is part of understanding its length. Uh, God needs to make an end of wickedness and the wicked ones on the earth. And the seven-year program it has very specific portions, which we'll be discussing today. Number two, uh, God needs to bring about a worldwide revival, not on the basis of the church, but post-church. And we're going to be discussing that today. And finally, he needs to get the message across to Israel. Uh, he needs to, to teach Israel once and for all not to rely on themselves, but rather to rely on his power. And we have in Daniel 12, 7, the final purpose of the tribul tribulation to break or scatter the power of the holy people Israel so that they'll turn back to God. And J.R., this makes uh, the uh, seven-year tribulation Jewish in its extent, in its purpose. Yes, in breaking the power of the holy people, Gary, it's interesting to note that the law provided curses. And in order to be saved, which we know, uh, which we are well aware of through the New Covenant, New Testament, mm -hmm. there's dispensation in which we live, is that salvation is by grace, not by works, not That's by correct. the works of the law. And the Jewish people uh, are, on a, are in a uh, university of hard knocks learning this. So in scattering the power of the holy people means that God finally convinces them that they cannot be saved by the works of the law of Moses, that their salvation must be and will be by grace. Now, J.R., uh, in our last broadcast, and this brings us to where we'll begin today, Jesus described the tribulation and specifically the middle portion of it when he said, for then shall be great tribulation, such was not uh, since the beginning of the world, and no, nor ever shall be. And when he used these words, J.R., he was talking about the abomination of desolation. As a matter of fact, he, he used the term abomination of desolation. Now, that's the Antichrist performing a certain deed. That deed <clears throat> is linked to Judea because Jesus said, when you see that abomination of desolation, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Well, that, that's not me. I'm not going to be in Judea. Right. And so, um, this is a Jewish concept. This, this Jacob's trouble here is uniquely Jacob's, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is not the trouble of, the, of any particular denomination of any particular country other than Israel and the Jews. And so the Jews are going to have to go through it. We can see throughout the book of Revelation, for example, in the first four chapters, we have the church. Mm -hmm. When we get to chapter 4 and following, the word church is not there. It's, it is just not there. That's true. We have saints in heaven. Uh, we have the second coming of Christ and all the saints with him. We have him setting up the kingdom in the last chapters of Revelation and run, uh, ruling for a thousand years, and we will rule with him. We see his bride ready for the wedding in chapter 19, mm -hmm. for the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the rest of it is Jewish. It's Jewish, and it has to do with, with uh, reconciling all the things that are broken mm -hmm. on, on this uh, world. And when the Lamb takes the seven-sealed book and opens that first seal, and this we pointed out last time, uh, we see a white horse, and he that, that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, J.R., here we begin our discussion of the time of the tribulation. He's riding forth conquering and to conquer 
obviously he hasn't conquered at this time. Yes. You know, it's interesting to me, Gary, that these four horses are mentioned in the same chapter. Mm -hmm. In other words, I believe they are riding in concert. When you see, uh, uh, in days past, an army advancing toward war, you don't see one horse. You see all four. Mm -hmm. you, you understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Yes. I believe that these four horses ride in concert together and are the implement through which the Antichrist takes over the world. Mm -hmm. I believe that this first one, of course, being the Antichrist, the second one here being a red horse uh, taking p uh, peace from the earth, uh, is the war that will catapult the Antichrist to his position of world power. There are two other reasons why the Antichrist will rise to power. One is depression, mm -hmm. uh, financial depression. And we can see that through the balance, you know, with the, uh, uh, in the hand of the uh, rider of this third beast and a voice saying, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And so th an economic downturn is going to be one of the catalysts upon which the Antichrist is looked to for the solution, his rise to world power. And then finally, death. And I think death will trail in the wake of the Antichrist. My I'm talk about the bodies being scattered over the landscape, all because of the Antichrist rising to power. Okay, we're talking about a, a, an event, in, a finite event in time here. Mm -hmm. And we have in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, or, or 2, 3 rather, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, and of course the discussion here is the day of the Lord, day of Jesus Christ, the uh -huh. judgment day, shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, the man of sin is the same as the Antichrist. And yes. it's fascinating that when Paul talks about him, he talks about him standing up in the temple. And he stands, uh, stands there showing himself to the people that, that he's God. Uh -huh. Okay, first of all, the temple. Now, right now, there's no temple, but there has to be one for yes. him to stand up in, right? Absolutely. The Jews have to rebuild the temple. Of course, they've been preparing for that for the last decade or so. And I think, as far as I know, all the implements for temple worship are now prepared and ready hmm. for the Antichrist. You know, J.R., it's always been fascinating to me that when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, uh, the temple was still standing. Priests were doing their daily service. Yes. And, by the way, they, they weren't very popular men among, uh, among Christians. They were thought of as evil men. And so when, when they got Paul's letter, it would have been easy for them to say, you know, that could happen today. The temple is over there in Jerusalem. And, uh, and this man could stand up, exalt himself as God any day now. There's an air of expectancy I say, in the first century sense. And I think today, because we read about the Jerusalem Temple Institute, and we're coming back around to a time when this could happen again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, um, the idea that a temple must be built is basic to the book of the Revelation. We get to chapter 7. Mm -hmm. John is given a reed, and the angel says, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So you see, mm -hmm. there's a temple there. And it's on the temple mount, but he, because he says, the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. Across the southern half of the temple mount today stands the Gentile dome of the rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the southern end. And so it's obvious, Gary, that here in Revelation 11, a Gentile section of that temple mount will be partitioned off and the Jews will be allowed to worship just to, to the side of it. And so as we begin to examine the seven-year tribulation with the Antichrist in view, we see him riding forth, conquering. We see the, him at some point standing up and calling himself God, and J.R., this must be what Jesus referred to as the abomination of desolation. Yes, and we take that to occur in the middle of the tribulation period. So we are through the introductory years and through the first half of the tribulation period when we get to the abomination of desolation. And, um, and another interesting thing we see about this, Gary, is that when this abomination takes place, he kills the two witnesses. 
Exactly. And by the way, and when we, we were, we're going to take a break here in just a moment. When we come back, we're going to mention the time given surrounding the two witnesses. So last time we talked about Elijah and yes. two distinct three and a half year periods. And we're going to also discuss the beast out of the earth in Revelation 13, uh, Mr. 666, and try to place him in the context of the middle of the tribulation. And we're going to deal with the last half of the tribulation period in the last half of this program. So don't go away. We'll be right back. We have a lot yet to go, so stay tuned. The tribulation period is centered around the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 9, we have the Antichrist confirming the covenant. Then we have the abomination of desolation and finally the destruction of the Antichrist. So this seven-year tribulation period is centered around him. Therefore, we want to spend the next few minutes talking about Mr. 666 himself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and J.R., what's fascinating about Mr. 666 is Revelation 13, 3 and 4 uh, is called one of the heads of the fourth beast, uh, the final world empire. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast and they worshiped the dragon which gave power to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast who's able to make war uh, with him? And there was given to, unto him a mouth speaking great things. And I'll stop right there. This is typical of the little horn of Daniel 7, isn't it? It's very about speaking great things. Absolutely. It's very much, it takes us back to Daniel. Daniel talks about the four beast empires, but he also has that little horn around the edges. Well, here he is again in Revelation. And so he's, it's not a surprise to us to see the world wondering after this man. They begin to worship him. And J.R. has something to do with a, a supernatural quality. That is, there, there's something going on here that we try to put our finger on, a miraculous recovery of some kind. And it's interesting that the church has been restraining the Antichrist until the church is taken out of the way, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And so evidently when the Antichrist begins to move and nothing can stop him, who is able to fight against this man? You know, who's able to make war with the beast? Uh, Gary, He's moved into his own now. Uh, he no longer has any enemies. Nobody's out to try to do him in now. He has full reign. He has full reign. And again, we're now in, in Revelation 13. <clears throat> we are at the time of the middle of the tribulation. And we have here the, the, the beast out of the earth in Revelation 13, 11. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. And this, this beast has power. He has power to give life to an image. He has power to, to call worship to himself. And, and this is the part that interests me, he has economic power. Mm -hmm. Because you can't buy or sell unless you yes. do it through the beast's authority. And it's important to understand that chapter 13 says that this power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. That's three and a half years, Gary. Yes, it is. I believe that's the last half of the tribulation period. Because as we pointed out earlier, he, uh, Revelation 6-2 has him riding forth, conquering and to conquer. Mm -hmm. Right at the very beginning. And now he has... Which means he has not conquered. Has you see, conquered. all these four horses of the apocalypse... That doesn't happen in a week That's right. or a month. It takes time. Logistically, time is involved there. And so after he rides forth conquering and to conquer, he arrives at this point where the deadly wound is healed. There's worship. There is wonder and signs and economic power. He's consolidated all his power. And at that point, which has yes. taken a lot of time, yes. he's given power to continue 42 more months. Yes. That's right. Now, during this introductory years and the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, however long that is, maybe it's uh, six, seven years in itself. We don't know for sure. But he has confirmed a covenant at the beginning of the seven years. In other words, he, has, he strengthens a covenant. A covenant is already there. How does he strengthen this covenant? Perhaps, Gary, by sending his own army into Jerusalem and occupying the land of Israel to make the Jews and the Palestinians get along. Hmm. Now, you know, for that, 
uh, it would have to be a multinational force, something like the United Nations and force. There's no question about that he does control the forces of the earth. Daniel chapter 11 calls him the willful king. And 1136 says, And the king shall do according to his will, and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. There's the abomination of desolation. Uh -huh. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 38 of, of Daniel 11 says, But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces, or more uh, possibly more correctly, fortresses, which is building an estate through uh, armed conflict. Yes. The god of fortresses. And military strength. Military strength. Mm -hmm. And Daniel 11 goes on to, and we don't have time to talk about it, but you can read it yourself. Read the entire chapter, of, uh, uh, the 11th chapter of Daniel. You'll see that the Antichrist is preoccupied with consolidating his power against various kings through armed conflict. Mm -hmm. And this, apparently, J.R., is the tenor of the, the Great Tribulation period. There, in addition to all the upheavals, there are these wars going on. Yeah, let me just throw a little thing out here. I don't know that this is going to be the way it is or not, but you know, the United Nations forces, though it contains m military people from various nations, by and large, it's United States troops. Is it possible that the one who has brokered all of this peace uh, process <laughs> in the Middle East might send an army in to occupy the country to make uh, make it possible for peace mm. to strengthen this covenant between uh, Netanyahu and, uh, or that is between Israel, whoever the whoever the leader of Israel is going to be, <laughs> Mr. Netanyahu now is yeah. is uh, his uh, term might be terminant, <laughs> terminal, uh, his, his uh, tenure might be tenuous right now. We don't know how long he's going to last, but. We know that there is continuing conflict between him, uh, between the Jews and the Palestinians. Mm. And there, somebody's going to have to step in to help them. Now, where does the Antichrist come from? Well, we, uh, we have already discussed, J.R., how uh, he is of the people of uh, Titus and Vespasian, destroyed the temple in A.D. 70. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, we have discussed the fact that he is a Danite, in all probability, and will be accepted by the Jews. Yes. Those two ideas don't conflict, do they? That's right. The rabbis mentioned 150 years before the birth of Christ that Dan would produce the Antichrist. He is the one in Genesis 49 that Jacob, the dying Jacob said was a snake. Mm -hmm. And so he gave the symbol of the seed of the serpent to the tribe of Dan. When we get to Revelation chapter 7, the tribe of Dan is missing. Obviously, he's on the other side. Yes, indeed. He provides no evangelists. No evangelists. <laughs> now, we come to to Revelation 17, and we'll sort of put it an end, uh, and a bookend on this. Uh, here is the mind that hath wisdom, verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue a short space, and the beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Here the beast, the Antichrist, is called the eighth king. Comes from a long line of rulers who tried to overthrow God's plan and dominate the world. And he'll be the last one who attempts it. Mm -hmm. This eighth king. The eighth king. You know, he's a fascinating fellow. We're not here to try to suggest who he might be, but you know, it's interesting that in Daniel chapter 11 it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, yes. nor the desire of women. And you can, trans you, you, you can interpret that any way you want to, but the fact of the matter is, he's a hypocrite <laughs> when he does not regard the God of his fathers, and secondly, there are women involved, mm -hmm. when he does not re have, he has no regard, he has no morals, yes. He has no conscience. He's moving toward one goal, world and, domination. And by the way, <clears throat> as, uh, as uh, is pointed out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 by Paul, he lies with great ease. And Paul refers to his activities as the lie. Mm -hmm. And God would send strong delusion that those left on earth in his time might believe the lie. Well, J.R., I, I think we have profiled the eighth king, the beast. Yeah. We have seen him... Uh, riding forth to conquer, we've seen him stand up three and a half years later, uh, at least three and a half years later, could be more, 
We've seen him it's stand the middle of the tribulation you're talking middle about. Middle of the here. tribulation. Mm -hmm. And then we have seen him p given power to continue for 42 months, another three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then we see him as the eighth king, the leader of a world convocation of nations at that time. And so we see him in his fullness. Now, we've covered at least seven years in, in his activities. Yes. Now, though our program has dealt with the uh, ministry or work of the Antichrist, let's get back to the main, pro main question at hand. How long is the tribulation period? We're convinced of the traditional view that the tribulation period is seven years long. Two reasons for that. Daniel 9.27. Uh, talks about the 70th week. That week is seven years. There's no way you can get about it. It's long been the Jewish belief mm -hmm. of the rabbis. This is the way it was written. From Daniel to this day, it is exactly that, seven years. And then, of course, we see in Revelation, the two witnesses minister for three and a half years, and then the Antichrist rules for 42 months or three and a half years. That's seven years. No way to get around it, Gary. That's right. And this, this, the three and a half year periods do not overlap. That is, you can clearly identify the period of rising power in the first three and a half years, the period of absolute power in the middle, and then the period of declining power, the latter three and a half years. Uh, they don't overlap. It, it adds up yes. to seven years. Yes, from the day he demands that everybody get a mark in the right hand of the forehead until Armageddon, there's a house of cards that begins to fall. That's right. And I think, my, my personal opinion is, the whole world is coming against the Antichrist. That's our mechanic. We'll be back in just a minute. We cannot conclude a program with, on the tribulation period without discussing the conclusion of the tribulation period. And for that, we go to the Battle of Armageddon and the fifth horseman of the apocalypse, Jesus Christ Ooh. returns. Revelation 19:11, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. J.R., you've called this the fifth horse of the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to put an end to the reign of the Antichrist. And, you know, in Daniel 12, the angel says, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,335 days after the abomination of desolation. That's right. And so, you know, even Armageddon doesn't, doesn't uh, conclude just, boom, here he is, it's over with. Mm -hmm. It takes 75 days to take care of getting rid of the enemy, uh, cleaning up mm -hmm. the land. Um, establishing his kingdom mm -hmm. and all of the various uh, political appointments that need to be made. Uh, uh, I, I think that we've got to have some time for this. And yeah. three and a half years is just too short it's for the tribulation too, period. Too short. This, uh, we have to have a seven full year period. Uh, Revelation 19:19. 19, 19, we see the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war. And of course, uh, Jesus rides forth uh, and does the final conquering here. J.R., uh, there's such a clear progression of events regarding the beast. We see him riding forth, standing up as God, and then being destroyed. And we see that clear seven-year period. Mm -hmm. And of course, following that, the kingdom of our Lord. Do you know him as your Savior? If you don't, trust him today. This is J.R. Church and Gary Sturman. Until next time, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current programs on audio tape. Or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, add $3 for shipping and handling. And to order, call the 800 number on your screen right now.